Brian J. Bird is a partner with Snell and Wilmer. Many of you have probably heard of that law firm. Uh, does a lot uh, around the valley. And uh, Brian serves as chair of the firm's Emerging Business Group, which was uh, founded in 1938. The firm was Snell and Wilmer. It's a full-service business law firm. Over 400 attorneys practice in nine offices throughout the Western United States and Mexico. And Brian is a business lawyer advising entrepreneurs and emerging growth companies in all stages of development, uh, from the beginning, from formation to liquidity. Uh, he also represents banks, financial services companies, private investors, and venture capital funds. Now buckle up, this is what Brian has extensive experience in. Uh, corporate formation, reorganization and governance, private equity and debt financing, shareholder owner relations, buyouts and disputes, employment and consulting agreements, employee incentive programs, general contract negotiations, supplier manufacturing agreements, securities regulation, technology transfer and licensing, joint ventures and strategic alliances, fund formation, cloud computing, corporate asset protection and succession planning, and mergers and acquisitions. All of that stuff. I don't know how he has time to know half of it. Uh, and I don't even really, frankly, know what half of it means. But we're going to move on. Having previously founded and raised capital for and run his own company, because he does have uh, experience on both sides, Brian brings a real-world perspective to his practice. Brian received his BA in political science and philosophy, summa cum laude, from Allegheny College, where he was class valedictorian and member of Phi Beta Kappa. He earned his JD from Harvard Law School, where he served as managing editor of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. So he dabbled in a little media as well. Let's welcome Brian to the stage. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Andy and the rest of the SCORE team for the opportunity. It is a uh, real honor to speak to you today. So we're going to talk in the next uh, 25 minutes or so about five legal issues that can kill your business. So as a former entrepreneur myself, and I get the privilege to work with entrepreneurs and their companies all day long, I see what little it can take to take out your business. Uh, all of you who are involved in forming and running your own company know all the personal and professional sacrifices that you make to make that company successful. Uh, a lot of late nights, a lot of financial sacrifices, time away from family, and to me, the silliest thing you could do is let one of the things we're going to talk about take down your business. If the market doesn't like your product, that's one thing. If a competitor comes and gobbles you up, that's one thing. But these are things, I think, that you can take home with you and hopefully not make the same mistakes that we see day in and day out. We've got 100 litigators in our downtown office out of our 200 uh, lawyers here in Phoenix, and they're constantly busy because people do things that they probably could have avoided, but they may not know to avoid those, or they just uh, fall into those traps. So we're going to take time today, the top five issues you can uh, take away here to avoid. Number one, all eggs in uh, one corporate basket. So it goes without saying, if you're going to operate a business, you better have a company from which to operate the business. If you're thinking about being a sole proprietor and you say, hey, it's not worth setting up a company, then you're putting your own personal assets at risk. Let's assume you're not going to do that. So you have a company, you're operating the company, you say, well, if things don't go well, the worst case is if I get sued, if uh, something bad happens, the worst case is I'll bankrupt the company. Well, there's a better way to think about it. And as the downturn hit in 2008 and beyond, we saw that a lot of companies wish they had thought about uh, subjecting their companies and restructuring in a way that would protect the critical assets. Let's take a uh, easy example. Uh, you operate your business and you own the building in which your business operates. So you've done a little real estate investing along with that business. What you don't want to have happen is the company gets sued and you lose both the business and the building that you work so hard to save for. And there's a way around that. The option is to avoid having that claim take down the entire company. And you can do that by separating out your assets and operations. How do you do that? Well, you create another entity to hold that building. So you have an entity that holds the building and it leases it to your operating company. If the company itself gets subjected to claims, that building is safely tucked away in that other entity. 
and you live to fight another day. And you can do that with any number of other valuable <coughs> assets that may be in your company. It could include different lines of business. Maybe you're in two or three different lines of business. Uh, they have different risks associated with them, so you decide to separate them out. Maybe you're expanding into California, where it's uh, notoriously difficult to do business, a lot of regulatory issues to deal with we don't have here in Arizona, and risks that come with it. So maybe you separate out your California operations into another company. Maybe you have intellectual property. Uh, you have a patent on your product, and you say, you know what, I don't want to subject that patent to the claims of any creditors, so I'm going to take that technology, stick it in a separate company. So again, if we get sued, and the business itself goes down, that patent lives to fight another day. You can maybe restart the company in another form at some point in time. So an easy thing to do, most people don't do it, don't think about it. They figure if I set up the company, that's enough, I'll worry about it later. And again, an easy way to restructure before claims hit in order to protect those valuable assets. Of course, you have to, and just for time's sake, we're not going to get into all the nuances, but you have to respect your own fences. So if you're setting up two companies, you can't operate them as though you just have one company. You need to make sure that you respect both entities. You have separate books. You have an economic relationship between the two companies. You're not just acting as though those two companies don't exist. They can be in different structures, parent affiliate, uh, or subsidiary, I should say, affiliate structures. A lot of different ways to do it. The point is, don't wait until someone comes after you to get this set up because typically then it's too late. Do it now while nothing's happening or you're just getting started in order to provide that for protection for the future. How many people in here are going to have to raise some capital to operate their business? Raise your hand. At some point, whether you self-fund it or you raise capital, you're going to need money to get things up and going and to expand the business over time. Some businesses are more capital intensive. Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh. I think one of the former speakers has some, uh, some familiarity with that city as well. And I came from Pittsburgh. One of the things I noticed, I was here about 11 years next month, and one of the things I noticed, we still live in the Wild West. And when it comes to raising capital, uh, that holds true as much as anything else. People either don't know about the securities laws or uh, they figure, you know what, it's simply too complex, there's too much involved, I'm not going to worry about it, I'm going to raise capital, it's difficult enough to get people to write checks to put that money into my company, I'm not going to worry about all that goes with it, I'll hope for the best, I'll hope to make them a good return, and if it doesn't, uh, we'll deal with it down the road. When are these securities laws triggered, if you've even heard of those? Well, anytime you are offering someone an opportunity to invest in your business, that's when they're triggered. And they're triggered on both the federal and state level. So you may have heard of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, there's also a state Securities Commission in each of the 50 states, and they govern the process of allowing people to invest in your company. And again, for time's sake, we're abbreviating this, but I want to throw out the issues. This one happens all the time. Why should you care? Well, if you want a felony on your entrepreneurial resume, go ahead and ignore these rules. That's something you clearly uh, don't want to have. There's two agencies that you don't want to fool with. One is the IRS and the other is the Securities and Exchange Commission and their state equivalents. Those are two agencies that will come after you forever if you, uh, you know, violate these rules and get caught. It's just not worth doing. In fact, there's easy ways to navigate the process, fairly pain free, fairly cost effective to raise capital and do it the right way. In short, you have to have a private offering exemption at both the federal and state level. It, or it uh, depends on a variety of factors. Again, not going to have time to get into all those today. Uh, it depends on how much money you're raising, who you're selling it to. But there are paths to navigate your offering depending on which uh, roads you're going to take. Historically, you couldn't go tell people you're raising capital. That's one of the things that has uh, bugged clients for decades. The last 50, 60, 70 years, you were limited by who you could tell. You couldn't go on the internet, although there's a lot of people, of course, doing it illegally. You can't go on the internet and just advertise or raise capital. You can't go talk to the Phoenix Business Journal and say, we're raising capital. Go ahead and give me a call if you're interested. Historically, you couldn't do that. With the Jobs Act that was passed a few years ago and is still in the process of being implemented, there are new uh, opportunities to do that. Things like crowdfunding. How many people have heard of crowdfunding? Raise your hand. How many people think equity crowdfunding is legal today? Raise your hand. 
Well, you know where that question is going. There's plenty of people who think it's legal. It's not. If you're doing something on Kickstarter where you're getting a reward and you're not getting equity, legal. If you're trying to give people a piece of your company, not legal yet. So there's a number of things happening, hopefully coming online uh, as early as October. It should have happened a couple of years ago. It hasn't happened quite yet because they're concerned with what's going to happen when they release it. But know that that's happening. You also have to make disclosure requirements. You have to let people know what they are investing in. There is nothing wrong with people taking risks. They do it all the time. The whole point of these securities laws is you have to give your investor a fully informed investment decision. If you do that and they take the risk anyway, you've told them the good, the bad, and the ugly, and they still want to invest, and you lose all their money, the worst case is you shut the company down. And you want that to be the worst case. You don't want the worst case to be you get sued for securities fraud. That's a whole different level of uh, punishment, and you don't want to be in that uh, arena. Number three, no shareholders or operating agreement. How many people in here uh, have a partner in their business? Raise your hand. So probably about half of you. And at some point, you may bring in a partner. Why do you need a shareholders or who needs a shareholders agreement? Anyone with a partner. How many people in here have a partner and do not have a shareholders agreement or don't even know what that is? Raise your hand. So quite a few of you. Why do you need one? because you're going to disagree with your partner. It's going to happen at some point. It may be a nice disagreement. Uh, you're looking to take the company out for a little holiday party. You've got to figure out where to go. But typically, the disagreements get much more significant the longer the company's around. Some people say, you know what? I'm in business with a family member, so I don't need one of these. Well, I can tell you, after over 15 years of doing this, that the family disputes are the nastiest. You have all the business issues associated with your business and layer on top of that all the, the uh, family issues, all the emotional issues that go along with it. So if you're in business with your parents or your brother or one of your relatives, even more need to have something like this in place. What are the purposes? Well, you want to understand and align your expectations. Oftentimes you come in the company and the introduction indicated that I had my own company at one point. I've made some of these mistakes along the way in my own company. This was one of them, not having a good agreement in place. We didn't have the same types of uh, expectations, and it led to a, a whole number of issues when uh, operating my company a little over uh, 12 years ago. So it helps align those expectations. Where are you going to take the company two, three, five, ten years from now? You also allocate the management, economic, and information rights. Don't assume that the statute takes care of that. You form your company, and you say, well, I'm sure there's something in the law that will guide us if there is an issue. Unfortunately, that's not the case, especially those of you who have the infamous 50-50 partnership. That sounds great up front. You say, hey, we'll give each half of the company, we'll have to agree on all the decisions, and we like each other, so that's going to work well. That is one of the, uh, our litigators' favorite entity structures because ultimately, not only does it lead to disputes, but you can't resolve them because each side owns half the company, and there needs to be agreement to move beyond those issues. If you've got a shareholders agreement in place, you can allocate uh, those duties, allocate that decision making, and provide for ways to get around that. Maybe you buy the partner out. Maybe you yourself can get out. There's a lot of ways to deal with it. It doesn't happen if you've already got the dispute on the table and you haven't put an agreement in place. It facilitates orderly transition of the company. People want out. Not, all, not every partner is going to stick with you for the duration. How do you get them out of the company? Again, how do you get yourself out of the company without destroying the company's value? And finally, resolve the disputes without destroying the company. If we had a lot of time today, I could tell you dozens of horror stories collected over the years where people don't agree. And I just had a potential client email me in a panic last night. Uh, that those were his words, saying, you know what, my partners wanted a buyout. We didn't really talk about it. And now he's just taken all the cash out of the account as of yesterday, stuck it into another account, and then had a lawyer write me a letter because he wants to essentially try to extort a buyout. So that just happened in the last 24 hours. And there's plenty of issues and circumstances where it gets much worse. And the value of the company, sometimes worth millions, gets destroyed in this process because you don't have orderly transition. Number two, no contractual limitations of liability. So where can liability arise? Anytime you have a relationship with anybody you're dealing with, it could be an employee, it could be a vendor, certainly a customer can lead to liability for your company. If you are in business long enough, you will be subject to some type of claim. 
Maybe it's just a letter you receive. Maybe it's a lawsuit that you get served with. Eventually, someone's going to be unhappy with something about the company and your operation of it, and they're going to come after you. Isn't there an automatic limit? Most people think, you know what? A customer pays $1,000. Isn't the worst case I'm going to have to pay that $1,000 back? How many people think that's the case? Raise your hand. They pay you 1000 bucks. All right, I've already given you the answer, but of course, that's not the case. It could be a hundred times that. We call that consequential damages. I give you a real quick example. You're a printing company. You're printing up flyers for your customer. They pay you $10,000 to print up the flyers, and they're going to have a grand opening. They've spent another 100000 getting a caterer. They've got uh, some marketing materials that went out. They spent all kind of money for this grand opening. You printed the wrong date on the flyer. Nobody shows up. They show up two days late. Do you think they're going to come after you for the $10,000 mistake you made or the $110,000, which would include all the money they spent on a grand opening no one showed up for? They're going to come after you for the $110,000, and absent some protection in your agreement, they're going to have a good shot at potentially getting those consequential damages. All it would take is one of these claims to take down your company, potentially. It doesn't take two or three of them. It takes one to take down a small business, and there's no reason to have it when you can avoid it. How do you do that? Well, unless you negotiate it away. Every agreement that you have in place should incorporate some type of limitation of liability uh, provision in that agreement. Whether, you're, again, you're dealing with vendors that you're getting your materials from to produce your products, you're dealing with certainly customers, and even your internal relationships subject to some legal limitations should have that in there so that when you get sued, the worst is certainly not the 110,000, at most it's the 10,000, and often it could be much less than that. There's no requirement, even though it may seem fair, to give everyone their money back if something goes wrong. You can limit that substantially, and there are many industries where that happens. Take a look at the back of your parking ticket. I didn't do that yet, but I suspect there's probably something on there. You've seen the fine print that says, hey, something happens to your car uh, while you're in the uh, session here. Uh, we're not responsible for that. So there's all types of limitations of liability that happen all the time. You can take advantage of those. It's one of the things almost every time I get an agreement to review uh, that you know someone may have put together themselves. People like to pull things off the internet. They think they're saving a couple bucks. And what happens is, I get to read it when something bad takes place. They misprinted that flyer, and now they're coming in saying, gosh, we just got a letter asking us for 100000 How could that be? We only spent 10000 on the job. That's all they paid us. And by then, again, it's too late once the thing has happened. You can limit your areas of exposure. You can say we're not liable for certain types of damages. We're not liable for certain types of things. For example, you may say, going back to that example, Unless we materially screwed up the print job, we're not on the hook. If we printed the date wrong, that's material. If the color was slightly off, it's not uh, going to give rise to a claim. You can't get your money back for that. You can you know, tighten up and determine what you're on the hook for, what you're not. You can also limit those consequential damages and other types of damages, saying, worst case is, we're going to be on the hook for what you paid us. And then finally, of course, you can limit it even further to the extent that the marketplace will allow you, but there's no reason, in most cases, not to try and see what the market's going to allow, limit that liability even more significantly. So worst case is maybe you pay back 2,000 of that 10, maybe it's 20% of what they paid you, unless there's some egregious example where you really did something intentionally wrong to get you in trouble. Number one issue, litigation. How many people in here, just by a show of hands, have been involved in some type of litigation? Raise your hand. How many people enjoyed that process? Anyone? Whether you are, and that's one of the reasons I, I could never be a litigator. I'm not sure how my uh, fellow partners do it. If you're getting sued, you're clearly not happy. And if you're having to spend money with firms like ours to go after someone, you're not happy either. So no matter what, you're not happy talking to your lawyer. I like to work with entrepreneurs to help build businesses. And at least uh, they like to talk to us in most cases. But litigation is something that you do not want to be involved with. And there are ways to avoid it. Yet we see all the time people come in, I had no idea I was going to get this claim. And one of the things I, I uh, will tell you here in a second is what led to it. Things that, again, you can avoid. No reason to have this take down your business. Follow the law. Sounds simple, but people, when they're starting a business or operating a business, there's so much to do. 
they're focused on building the product, getting it to market, employing one of these uh, email campaigns or one of the other things you've heard about in today's program, either this morning or maybe this afternoon, that the legal stuff goes to the background. We understand it's not sexy, it's not exciting, but it is important knowing whether you can operate your company legally without infringing someone else's rights or without violating laws that may exist here in Arizona or some federal rules. We've talked about those security rules, for example, is critical. Take informed business risk. You guys, if you're entrepreneurs, you're all gonna take risk. I took risk when I had my own company. Anyone you get to invest in your company is taking risk. There's a difference between wild westing it I don't think that's a real term, but that's what I call it here in Arizona, which a lot of entrepreneurs do, and just say, you know what, I'll figure it out later, versus understanding the risk and taking informed risk. I think informed risk makes sense. You have to do that, but you need to have the information in hand before you take that risk. Document your expectations. What leads to litigation is undocumented expectations. If you have an agreement with a vendor, put it in writing. Yes, it takes a little more time, maybe costs a couple of bucks to do that. You'll be happy you did when you pull that agreement out of the drawer, or even at minimum some type of an email that documents those expectations. Build an escape hatch to get out of any relationship. It may not work, often it doesn't work. Make sure you have a way to get out if you need to. Follow the golden rule. Don't ask people to do things that you wouldn't ask uh, or have them do for you. Uh, and I think that's pretty important. People sometimes view business as a competition and how many points can I score as opposed to saying, you know what, let's treat the customers right, let's treat the employees right. If you do that and you follow the rule, it's going to avoid a lot of litigation opportunities. Interact in person. Just heard about some electronic ways to keep in touch, but in terms of avoiding litigation, there's often nothing better than just sitting down in a room and having a conversation or hit the coffee shop, have a conversation if there's a dispute. It doesn't matter whether it's an internal or external person, sending an email, or worse yet, a text, uh, it easily be misconstrued. You don't get the tone, you don't get an opportunity to interact, and I've seen these things just blow up after we get the email string. They could have avoided the issue. Sometimes there isn't even an issue, but yet they go back and forth, things get heated, the next thing you know, someone files a complaint. Could have been totally avoided by sitting down for five minutes, ten minutes, and talking through it. When disputes arise, resist the urge to send out an email or make an angry uh, posting, especially on Facebook or one of these other social media things. See, a lot of people do some crazy stuff, and you didn't have the opportunity to do that just you know, 10 years ago before all these outlets existed. I know it's tempting. I know you feel like you're wrong. Don't do it. Sleep on it. You've always heard that adage, sleep on it before you respond. I can't tell you how important that is in avoiding litigation. Let, uh, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours go through and get a reality check. Put a call in to someone like myself or someone else you work with who's not involved, doesn't have a dog in the hunt and can say, you know what, I think you're being a little ridiculous or, you know what, you may have a claim here, but it's not going to benefit your case by firing off a nasty gram. That's never going to be helpful to you. Understand the other side may not behave logically. Once I realized this, it made uh, the practice of law a lot simpler. People don't always do what's in their personal or economic best interest. Sometimes they act in a manner that makes absolutely no sense. And you think you're offering them some type of solution to solve the issue, you're giving them a refund, you're treating a partner in a way you think is very fair, and for whatever reason they're not behaving rationally and what you're offering is just not going to work. You need to understand that and act accordingly. Finally, and most important, this year I have the uh, privilege of serving as the chair of the Better Business Bureau. I'm a big believer in dealing with people on an ethical basis. And I always say if you have a choice between a, you know, a solid contract, between you and some relationship you have with the customer, employee, whatever, uh, versus dealing with someone on the other end who behaves ethically, I would choose the latter every time because it really is critical. We can do the best contract for you, but if the person on the other side is not going to behave ethically, again, no matter what the relationship is, it's going to lead to issues, as opposed to having a great agreement that they're not going to follow. I'd rather have no agreement, but know that when something goes wrong in the relationship, they're going to make, uh, make things right, and they're going to treat you fairly, just like they would appreciate that you do the same. Finally, the biggest threat, kind of a bonus threat, is no exit plan. People don't plan to exit the business. If you read any of the statistics, it shows you that most of your net worth gets bound up in the business. And no one thinks about exiting. They're too focused on getting in, starting, and surviving. 
And I can tell you that we've seen uh, owners who have no strategy, no involvement, they don't know where they're taking the business, and at some point they want to exit and cash out, and they've left money on the table if, in fact, that opportunity to cash out is even available. We had someone leave $10 million on the table a year and a half ago because they didn't do some tax planning. They could have done very simply, didn't do it until right before the closing, and then it was too late. And stories like that happen every day. So when you're thinking about starting, or if you're already in business, today's a great time to say, what am I looking to accomplish? Am I looking to pass the business on? Am I looking to sell it someday and fund my retirement? Whatever it is, map that out and work backwards to think about what you need to do today, tomorrow, and a couple of years from now to maximize that return. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to your family, given all the sacrifices you've made. So finally, let me just let you know real quickly whoops, about a, uh, some of the programs. If you like educational opportunities, we provide a free seminar down at ASU Sky Sun, Scottsdale McDowell Road, on the first Wednesday of every month. We've been doing it for six years now. Good free content, good opportunity to network with folks like you're seeing here today, get some good ideas, make some matches. We've actually got our next program tomorrow. If you're thinking about how to you know, purchase a business, we'll give you some great content at 7.30, 9.30 a.m. And then we have a really interesting story in May uh, someone who bootstrapped their company, has never taken an outside dollar from investors, and was on the 5000 list yesterday, uh, last year. So a local success story telling you how to do that. A lot of people don't want to raise capital. They'd like to fund it themselves. There's a story uh, behind that I think will be interesting for you. So I think we're probably uh, almost out of time. I don't want to keep you uh, from lunch. I will be sticking around for the uh, mentor session. So if you have any questions, be happy to chat with you. And if you can't get to me today, I think they're going to post the presentation if you want a copy. And I'd be happy to chat with any of you, free of charge. You don't hear that often from lawyers. So I encourage you to take advantage just not all at once uh, to kick around some ideas you may have for starting your business, addressing one of these issues, or some other thing that's popped up that maybe you always wanted to know the answer to, but just didn't have the opportunity. So with that, uh, any questions? We have time for one or two questions.